Hello, everyone, and welcome. I want to invite you to take a journey with me along a path traveled by one who's given us all a great deal. Author, activist, journalist, and seeker of truth, Michael Wallace is all of this and much more. So, it seems only fair we chronicle as much as possible about him. As I've read his words over the years, I've been lured to places never visited and come to know people who are no longer strangers to me. Michael has certainly kneeled and dipped his cupped hands into the cool, soothing waters of history and drunk his fill, a practice he continues still. The results? He's shared with us all, and they are inspiring. Our journey begins in Missouri, a state that's produced at least one president of the United States, a journalist that wore the label, the most trusted man in America, and one who heard the call of the Old West and knew straight away he belonged in the saddle. He would eventually become the sheriff of Radiator Springs, but he made his bones riding the range and chasing strays in the concrete canyons of St. Louis. He won his first writing award in grade school, an essay on his days as a school safety officer, and he was on his way then to becoming a journalist. The University of Missouri is his alma mater, but the streets of various New Mexico towns provided his master's degree. A tour of duty with the Marine Corps was followed by what he called his Hemingway years. Here, in his Tulsa Midtown studio, Michael Wallace is surrounded by museum quality items. Each carries some memory or meaning. Space is a premium. It's here though, surrounded by his research, where he brings to life all of the spirits and creations that become bestsellers. It started with learning about storytelling. And I learned about storytelling principally from two different women. My mother, Ann Wallace, and her mother, uh, Marie Bonner Darcy, Marie Darcy, who lived with us for quite a while. And those are the women who instilled storytelling in me. And basically that's what I still am, is a storyteller. But there's more to it than that. Intense research and accuracy in all of his stories is the mark of this historian. Probably comes from my experience as a journalist, because for many years I worked for newspapers and then for magazines. I was a special correspondent for Time and wrote for Time and People and those magazines, but did a lot of newspaper work. As a journalist, I was always especially, of course, with hard news stories. And I did a lot of hard news stories, believe me, when I was in the Caribbean Bureau for time. I needed to get it right, and I didn't have a lot of time, so I had to get it right. I had to find those sources and make sure that they were authentic sources, and I worked very, very hard at that. Uh, then, when I decided to leave journalism and write a bigger farm, start writing books, uh, I found my niche. And my niche was to write nonfiction books, biography, books about different people, American culture. But I started focusing on people, groups of people, events and so forth, that are so entwined in myth and legend that you can't make heads or tails out of it. Uh, people who are, are so wrapped up in innuendo and exaggerations and legend and lies and myth. And I love myth. There's nothing wrong with myth, but there's a time and a place for myth. So that's my niche, and that's what critics and my readers have discovered about me. And, and, and in order to do that and do it right, it requires incredible and precise research. The first book I wrote and published was called Oil Man, uh, the story of Frank Phillips and the birth of Phillips Petroleum. And uh, th that uh, book came out in 1988, and it was published by Doubleday. I didn't even have an agent yet, but that book took off. It's still very much in print, like many of my books are, and that launched 
the big form, the writing career, and that was immediately followed by Route 66, The Mother Road, which is and still is a huge book. You know, so million copies earned me the first of three Pulitzer nominations, was a big bestseller, continues to sell today. It's considered the Bible of the road, the the book that really sparked the revival of Route 66. And then, of course, that led me to work with Pixar and do the Cars movies. That's right. He was a voice actor in the Cars movies, and his role packed a lot of weight. I was the voice of the sheriff of Radiator Springs looking for tractor tippers. Yes, and when that movie came out, business on 66 on stretches of it went up 30%. It had such an impact. After 19 successful books, you might think writing comes easy for Wallace. If so, you'd be wrong. An old sports writer, Red Smith, mostly attributed to him this quote when, when, when someone said to him, well, you've written so much now, it must get easy. So, yeah, it's really easy. I just sit down at my typewriter and open a vein. And that's what I do. It's the writing. It's sitting down by myself with my derriere on that chair, on that keyboard. That's the tough part. That's when the bleeding begins. Cyrus Avery was responsible for the existence of, and is considered the father of Route 66, known as the Mother Road. And Michael Wallace is now known as her son. Well, it makes me feel good to be called the son of the, uh, of the Mother Road or the new father of Route 66. Um, I, I, uh, I don't mind that at all. I, I used to think that it was kind of typecasting me. I, I sometimes would be resentful that all I was known for was Route 66, but that's changed, thankfully, because a lot of my books have become bestsellers and I've done a lot of different things. And quite frankly, when that book came out and was an immediate success, I mean, we were all over the place. On, the, on that first national book tour from Chicago to Santa Monica, they went back to press three or four times. Uh, the New York Times, LA Times, BBC, Good Morning America, uh, all these, this attention and people, reporters would say, are you surprised by this? And I'd say, well, no, I, there are other people like me who know that 85% of the road is still there. The federal government might have taken down the shields, but that road's still alive. More importantly, those people are still out there. So you might ask, what has all his research and writing taught him about all of his subjects? Well, there is a common thread. And it's true, certainly, of Frank Phillips, that wily old oil man, or his kid brother, Waite. It's, it's, it's true of every outlaw I've written about. It's true of David Crockett, never wrote the name Davy in his life. They were human beings. And the shorthand for this, Sam, is to put it this way. I put it this way. In the 19th century American West, there were some white hats and there were some black hats, but there were one hell of a lot of gray hats. Most of the hats were gray, you know. Even Frank Phillips wore a gray hat. They were human beings, you know. Bell Starr wore a gray hat. On the other side of the law, Wyatt Earp wasn't like you, O'Brien, on the TV show that we watched when we were kids. He wore a dark gray hat, you know. Uh, they all did. They went on both sides of, of the law. They danced on that very thin line that separates the righteous and the felonious. They were right on that line. People forget that the famous Coffeyville, Kansas shootout with the Dalton gang. Three of those brothers were deputy U.S. Marshals at one time. They just weren't making enough money from old Judge Parker. So they went on the scout. They went on that hoot owl trail. And uh, I think that's, that's the biggest lesson of all, is that human condition, the human story. Some of the folks he wrote about made lasting impressions. One in particular did, and he'll carry her memory for the rest of his life. And that's not surprising. Wilma Mankiller was a woman that touched many hearts. 
a quietly strong woman. That was Wilma Mankiller. I truly loved her. Uh, we were, I was a month older than Wilma. And uh, the first big national story done about Wilma was for me. It was a profile for People magazine, of all things. When she was deputy chief, Ross Swimmer had made her deputy chief. The best thing Ross Swimmer ever did. She was just an amazing woman. What you saw is what you got. Boy, she was a superhuman being, and I truly loved everything about Wilma Mankiller, and I miss her still to this very day. Michael followed David Crockett from his Tennessee birth in 1786 to his death in the Battle of the Alamo in 1836. He's also brought back to life his share of scoundrels, Billy the Kid, for example, and Pretty Boy. Pretty Boy Floyd was the consummate rascal that everybody loved. Everybody except those bankers in the G-Men. Uh, he was a true social bandit. Floyd actually did. He did live as a sagebrush Robin Hood. I found out through my research he actually did give money to people. He did rob banks that were foreclosing on those dirt farmers. He did destroy unrecorded mortgages. He lived off the goodwill of the land and ended up having the biggest funeral in Oklahoma history in 1934. He also came to know Woody Guthrie. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Woody sits in the corner sometimes strumming on his machine while from time to time they actually talk about any number of research projects that Michael has swirling about in this room. Woody Guthrie, about Pretty Boy Floyd, who you wrote a song about, said on the day of Pretty Boy's funeral, Pretty Boy could be elected governor today, and he'd probably be a good one. And Woody taught that song to both Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. This land is your land should be the national anthem. It, it really should. This was a guy who was maligned by so many people, not just rednecks and close-minded people, but people never really understood Woody, uh, except for the few open-minded people that, that got him. He was a real troubadour. When we started the National Literary Landmark Program, we made sure that Woody was the first one in Oklahoma to be made a literary landmark in Okima. You might think with all he's accomplished in his life, Michael is a man with no regrets. If so, you'd be wrong. He has a couple. One involves baseball. The other is historian Angie DeBeau. My biggest regret in life, one of them, and I don't have very many, is that I never met Angie DeBeau. I've dedicated books to her. I think she represents a, a, a very rare breed in the chronicling of American history. She was a female historian back in the day when there weren't very many. And she had to put up with that good old boys club, and it was tough. But Angie DeBeau got it right. Despite the odds, despite the naysayers, she got her history right, and it's still true today. Remember, I said he also has one other regret about baseball? That I didn't play left field for the Cardinals for at least three seasons. Just three seasons, that would have been enough, and I regret that. We came very close to losing Michael a few years back. It was a beautiful day in October of 2001. He was on his way to a lunch meeting and stopped his big Harley-Davidson motorcycle for a red light right here at 15th and Denver. The light turned green, he started through the intersection, and that's the last thing he remembers. A young woman ran a red light, struck him broadside. He remembers well the moment he came to. I'm lying there in the middle of Denver Avenue. Fortunately, in my full gear, leathers and a helmet, or my head would have smashed like a grape. And the first thing I think of is, I'm alive. Then I think, God, I'm so thankful I, I'm a good writer. 
Then the pain started moving up my body and people were gathering around me and talking about how I looked and I said, please back off if you're going to talk about me. And then a good Tulsa policeman was right there and he said, oh my God, thank God you're alive and, and your, your head's still intact. And I said, yeah. And then I heard this crying, this weeping. And I said to the policeman, who is that crying? And he said, it's the girl that ran over you. And I said, go over and tell her that I just died. And he said, what? I said, tell her that I just died right here. And he said, I can't do that. I said, okay. And then I put that girl out of my head forever, right there. But that was, those were my very first thoughts and actions. He implored the doctors not to take his leg, and they didn't. But what followed was repeated hospitalizations, several surgeries, and a great deal of pain and therapy. He came out on the other side with a slight limp and his motorcycle days behind him. But his talent grew stronger, and he's still on the go. In fact, now he seems to travel more than ever. But he always comes back to this Tulsa studio where the ghosts are frequent visitors. I love this room. This room means everything to me. It's a, 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 a place of solace. It's a place where I can weep, where I can laugh, where I can wrestle, where I can sit down to that keyboard and open a vein. And uh, to me, it's a very special place. And I'm surrounded by the totems, these little icons that have come my way over the years over my many years as a writer. I, I can almost hear voices every day in this room when I look at Pretty Boy Floyd's death mask or, or touch that worn handle of that ax that D.H. Lawrence chopped wood with for two years up at Taos, or pick up these pieces of a log cabin where they film Shane out by the Tetons, or, or, or our original branding iron of the 101 Ranch. I, I hear it all. I, I hear the music. I, I can smell Frank Phillips' bay rum and the hint of a Havana cigar. Uh, all of my senses are, are interrupted or visited by these memories, this knowledge that you accumulate over the year when you're collecting the lives of people. I am a huge believer in ghosts and as my mother used to call them, angels in disguise. I believe in that so much. You know, I tell this story when I was a kid growing up with those storytellers, my mother and my grandmother, uh, just about as far off Route 66 as Stan Musil could swat a hardball. I can remember those days when hobos, not bums, but hobos, or tramps, as we called them, men of the road, would come to our house. And they'd come to that back door, doff their cap, and ask my mother if she had some work in exchange for some food. And my mother always found work, something heavy that needed to be moved, some weeds that needed to be pulled, something for them to do. And then she'd feed them. Sandwich, some leftover stew, a piece of fruit, some pie, some ice water, maybe a cup of coffee. And they wash their hands at the faucet outside and sit under the trees and eat that food. And then they'd come up, give her the plates and thank her, and they'd walk out of our lives. And while they were eating, my mom would, I'd pull a chair over to the sink where she was stationed looking out the window doing her thing. And we would make up stories about these men who they were. We'd make up imaginary names for them and what they were doing. A lot of them had been in the war and you could see tattoos or an old piece of uniform. It was great. We'd make up these stories. And then when they'd left and walked out of our lives, my mother would always say the same thing to me. And this happened several times. She'd say, Michael, you never turn anyone away from the door. They could be an angel an angel in disguise. And those words have stayed with me forever. So yes, I do believe in ghosts. And I have the ghosts of all the people I ever write about come visit me and inhabit me. It doesn't unnerve me at all. I welcome it. 
It's important to note Michael isn't making his journey alone. Married in 1982 to Suzanne Fitzgerald Wallace, she's traveled right along beside him. She reads me like a book. I would not be where I am today without Suzanne Fitzgerald Wallace. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. And that's true from the get-go. That's true from the get-go. She is every bit of my breath, of my creative breath, of my... I, I, I just can't imagine life without her. For both, there are a great many memories and good times, but one that took place before his accident stands out. One of our favorite times, one of my favorite times, was the first Harley-Davidson tour that we led. Um, that was a memorable experience. We both rode behind Harley riders and met so many people, and it was just a really unusual and great trip down Route 66. Michael Wallace has written 19 best-selling books. He's been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize three times. It may happen yet. These boxes are research for his 20th book, On the Life of Bell Star, and he's already opened the vein. Looking back, he could have settled anywhere, but he decided on Oklahoma. And if you wonder why, here, in his own words, is the reason. Oklahoma is tall grass prairie and everlasting mountains. It is secret patches of ancient earth tromped smooth and hard by generations of dancing feet. It is the cycle of song and heroic deed. It is calloused hands. It is the aroma of rich crude oil fused with the scent of sweat and sacred smoke. It is the progeny of an oil field whore wed to a deacon, the sire of a cow pony bred with a racehorse. It is a stampede, a pie supper, a revival. It is a wildcat gusher coming in. It is a million dollar deal cemented with a handshake. Oklahoma is dark rivers snaking through red, furrowed soil, lakes rimmed with stone bluffs. It is the ghosts of proud Native Americans, crusading socialists, ambitious cattle kings, extravagant oil tycoons, wily bandits. It is impetuous and it is wise, a land of opportunists, resilient pioneers and vanquished souls, the state is a crazy quilt of contradictions and controversies, travails and triumphs. It has been exploited and abused, cherished and fought over. It is a puzzling place. Forever, Oklahoma is American through and through. Michael Wallace is now 73 years old and shows no sign of slowing down. He's a master wordsmith that loves the mother road and all who knew her. He is her son and proud of it. And while he still looks to the future, he wants to be remembered in the simplest of terms. There's nothing I can do about what's behind me. As far as the future, I just hope and intend to keep living for some years to come because I have still so, so much to do, including writing some fiction. So, how does he want to be remembered? Simply put, he was a damn good storyteller. Not a problem, old friend. You earned that title a long time ago. I'm Sam Jones, and this has been Perspectives, featuring Michael Wallace. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.